Welcome to your Hope-Filled Perspective with Dr. Michelle Bankson. October is Depression Awareness Month, and in the last several episodes of your Hope-Filled Perspective, we have talked with several guests who have shared their story of going through depression. But I felt like we would really be remiss if we didn't spend at least one episode talking about how to support a depressed loved one. Primarily because mental health awareness is twofold. One, learning to live with it, and the other is learning to live through it. In this episode, my husband, Scott, and I are going to be discussing how to support a depressed loved one. Scott, I've been very open with my struggles with depression. How would things have been different for you if you had had a resource telling you how to support me? Oh, what a, what a difference it would have made. Just the whole world would have been different. At that time, uh, which was many years ago, I just had no concept that that resource was even available to, to, uh, to find help for someone supporting the person going through depression. Pretty much because that resource wasn't available. <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't, I don't think there really was anything out there that as a clinician that I even knew of for educating spouses, loved ones, friends, for how to support those who go through depression. And I think what makes it so difficult is much like heart disease or cancer or losing a child is if you've not gone through it, you really have no idea of what that experience is like. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that makes it then hard for you then to know yeah. how to support someone, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's true. And then anything that, that you come up with that you think might help has to come out of your own head. You can't look at a sheet of paper and go, oh, 20 suggestions. Number one, seven, and 15 are easy to do. I'll do those. That, that just, that list just wasn't there. Right. Right. That's in part why I think we need to have this discussion. Yes, we do. So tell me, you wrote the book about depression. What prompted that? When I decided to write the book, Hope Prevails, Insights from a Doctor's Personal Journey Through Depression, really I wanted to provide a resource to those who could not come into my private practice. Mm -hmm. I wanted to provide something for those who wanted to know what could they do to get out of depression. But I'm just one doctor and I could only see so many patients a day, but I constantly had people contacting me saying, help me. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to provide that resource, but I also felt like there needed to be a resource for the loved ones and friends to support those mm -hmm. who were going through depression. And so the last chapter of the book was supposed to be how to support a depressed loved one. But that chapter got cut. Too many words in the book. It was too many words. And per my contract with the publisher, the book could only be so many words. But I was so strong in my conviction that that resource was necessary, that what I decided to do was put a link in the end of the book, that if you bought the book, there was a link, and you could go to that link, mm -hmm. and on my website is now the free chapter, How to Help a Depressed Loved One. And that goes into much more depth than what we will be able to talk about today in one short episode. But really, what I want to do today is give some of those suggestions so that anyone listening who has a depressed friend, who has a depressed loved one, even those who are struggling with depression today, who wants to share with their friends and loved ones how they can be of help, that's our goal for today. Well, sure. Then why don't you tell us uh, just about depression? What is it? Depression is a medical condition. Mm -hmm. It is not just something made up in someone's head. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a medical condition where people experience, it's considered a mood disorder. Okay. 
as such, it has to be treated like any other medical condition. It mm -hmm. is as worthy and justifiable as heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. And so we have to consider it with as much viability as any other medical condition. Well, but you're talking about three of the, the, the biggies there, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Where does depression fall in with that in terms of prevalence? Oh, let me tell you, by 2020, depression will be our greatest epidemic worldwide. It will be more prevalent than diabetes, cancer, and heart disease put together. Oh my goodness. So we cannot ignore it. In the United States, one in four will struggle with depression at some time in their lifetime. And what's important to keep in mind is all those major medical conditions that we just talked about, mm -hmm. when people struggle with those, they often then struggle with depression as a secondary condition. It comes along in the package. It does. And it's not something that we can just say, get over it. Yeah. Nobody wants to struggle with depression. And so if they could just get over it, believe me. It's like they saying, would. saying, I'm sorry, you have cancer, just get over it. If they could, they would. Sure. And nobody wants cancer. Nobody wants heart disease and nobody wants depression. But, but isn't depression the same as having the blues? It is not the same as having the deep blues. But sometimes it starts off as the blues. Mm -hmm. The blues are really, you know, we all have those slumps in our days, in our weeks, mm -hmm. where ah, we're just having a down day. Mm -hmm. So depression can start off as the blues. But when you experience the blues for more than about two weeks at a time, then we might be looking at a true clinical case of depression. Everybody experiences depression a little bit differently, but there are some common signs and symptoms. There's almost always a change in mood, and not everybody feels down and depressed, so to speak. Some experience depression in terms of anger, that was one of the ways that I expressed my depression a lot of the times was through anger. Some experience it in terms of irritability, agitation. Some cry all the time. Some never cry. And that's why they think, oh, well, I don't have depression because I don't cry. Hmm. But that would be a myth because not everybody with depression cries. Mm -hmm. There's almost always a change in socialization. A lot of people who experience depression no longer feel like doing the things that they always enjoyed doing before. They don't have the same motivation that they did. There's frequently a change in energy level. Mm -hmm. A lot of times those things that we just do normally in our day to day, if you're depressed, those things are so much harder. I remember when I was going through depression, I would look at my vitamins and I would look at my toothbrush in the bathroom and think, that's just too much effort. I'll do that tomorrow. And I think about that now and I think, how much effort does it take to brush your teeth? Like almost nil mm -hmm. or to take your vitamins. But when I was depressed, I just thought, I, I just don't have the energy for that today. And I remember thinking, taking a shower? Oh my word, you might have told me that I had to climb Mount Everest. Because it wasn't just taking a shower. It was getting undressed. It was turning on the water. It was shampooing my hair, washing, toweling off, then finding additional clothes to wear. And then I had to blow dry my hair. It was too much. It was too much. And so people with depression experience those day-to-day -day normal activities. It just requires too much effort, too much energy. And... People with depression often experience a change in sleep and a change in appetite. And for some, they sleep too much and eat too much, and others will sleep too little or eat too little. Mm -hmm. And I remember, depending on how severe my depression was, my experience with those would be different. Mm -hmm. But so what I want people to hear is that everybody's experience with depression is different, just like people's experience with allergies can be different. Some people will present with a doctor and they'll have itchy eyes and a runny nose and other people will be stuffed up and they'll just experience um, difficulty with energy level. All those symptoms are equally valid. 
And so just because your experience is different than mine makes it no less valid. Well, I've got a bunch more questions for you, but it's time to take a break. Let's take a one minute commercial break. Listeners, I want you to stay with us though, because after this commercial break, we're going to really dive into what does it take to help a depressed loved one? This is valuable information. Even if you don't have a depressed loved one right now, I promise you will know someone who's depressed. So stick with us. We'll be right back in a minute. Welcome back to your Hope-Filled Perspective with Dr. Michelle Bankson. Today, we are talking about how to support a depressed loved one. And with me today is my husband, Scott Bankson. Scott is one who had to learn how to support a depressed loved one when I experienced depression. So I thought it only fitting that he join us in the conversation today. Well, Michelle, you know, already the conversation we've had has brought back to my mind some of the experiences I had during that time. But before uh, I share any of those, why don't you tell us some, some ways that you've put your finger on professionally here and personally in your own support of a depressed loved one, your, your mother, um, yeah. and some of the ways that you had to make accommodation and really provide the grace that, that somebody needs uh, to, to walk through that part of life. You know, I think one of the ways that we can really support someone who's going through a depressed time is to enter into the experience with them. That can be hard because, like we talked about before the break, everyone's experience with depression is different. And when my mother was depressed, she got very silent. When I was depressed, I got very angry and very vocal. Either of those are difficult when you love someone because though neither of those are expressions of love but one of the ways that we can help is offer to enter into their experience with them for example by offering to make an appointment for mm -hmm. them to go see a doctor and the reason why i'm bringing that up first is because first of all we need to determine if there's a medical condition that's going on that mimics depression or that is bringing about depression. Mm -hmm. Sure. There are many medical conditions that actually bring about symptoms of depression, mm -hmm. but it's a medical condition. Such, certain, such as? Like certain vitamin deficiencies. Okay. Um, thyroid conditions can bring about a lot of the symptoms of depression, like okay. lethargy, uh -huh. changes in appetite. So the very first thing we want to do is rule out a medical condition so that we're not treating a medical condition as if it's a psychiatric or mental health condition. Mm -hmm. Because if we're treating something with medication like an antidepressant and it's really a medical condition, we can wreak havoc in the body. Mm -hmm. So by offering to make the doctor's appointment and then even offer to drive them go with them, sit with them in the waiting room, and if they want you to go with them into the doctor's appointment, that can be so helpful because that can be really frightening to go to the doctor sure. and hear what the doctor has to say. And it can be embarrassing mm -hmm. to have to bring about those symptoms that you've been experiencing. And a lot of times with various medical conditions, depression included, Sometimes our memory is not quite as astute as it otherwise would be. And it's real hard to remember all the things that the doctor tells us. So by having a loved one there with us, the loved one can remember some of the things that we may not otherwise remember. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Another way that we can be supportive is to make plans with our depressed loved one. Mm -hmm. We talked about how sometimes our energy level is not the same. And, and there's changes in our interest level. We don't feel like doing some of the things sure. that we used to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So a depressed loved one is not going to be apt to call you and say, hey, let's get together for coffee. Yeah, right. But they still want to be involved. They still want to be included. So call and make plans. Call and say, hey, I've really missed you. How about if I bring coffee over? Take the initiative. Yes. Right. Yes. Even when it's not reciprocal. Yes. And... When they turn you down that first, that second, that third time, keep making the effort to include them. Mm -hmm. One of these times, they're going to say yes. Yeah. And it communicates love 
it communicates that you care, even if they say no. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I understand that. Something else that really helps is if you will continue to encourage and remain positive. It is so hard when you're depressed to stay positive because everything feels and looks negative. And so it can help if you will stay positive. Mm -hmm. Not Pollyanna, that doesn't help. Happy, happy, happy all the time? No, yeah. but try to remain positive and encouraging. Mm -hmm. You know, um, encourage them when, when you notice them smiling, say, I just love it when I see your smile. So not in a critical way, not saying, oh, you should be more thankful or you should be more No, try to avoid to the shoulds because they're doing the best they can to even get out of bed. So latch on to the positives when you see them. Yes, yes, absolutely. Extend them. I would also ask, how can you pray for them? It's nice to hear I'm praying for you. That's really nice. But I think it's even more helpful if you are asked, how can I pray for you? Mm -hmm. Because you may not know what needs they really have. Mm -hmm. They might have a need to get out of bed to make their children's lunch, get dressed and take their children to school. And you might know that's really difficult for them. But if you ask, how can I pray for you? that offers them the opportunity to share what's really difficult in their walk. And then you know how to pray more effectively. Right. I think even as a spouse, sometimes you probably didn't know what my greatest struggles were. No, no. It was all just what I thought I saw. Right. Which maybe that was right, but maybe that was wrong. Yeah. yeah. So by asking, how can I pray for you? First of all, that tells them you're praying yeah but it gets you on the same page and then if you're willing pray with them then they hear you pray and there's something that changes when you actually hear people praying for you mm. and then by all means when you tell someone you're praying for them please do it i know life is busy yeah. but oh my goodness when you tell someone that you're praying do it do it. You're, you're making a covenant, not just with them, but with God. Mm -hmm. Another way that you can support is just be willing to sit with them. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I talk about this on this program and in counseling sessions and every speaking engagement I get, I think you already know what I'm going to say. What's <laughs> one of my favorite stories in the Bible is about the book of Job, yep. right? Yep. Because I love the beginning of the book of Job where his friends came and they just sat with him. They didn't get in trouble until, until, they, opened their mouths. until they opened their mouths because they thought they knew what Job's problem was. They thought they knew what caused his problems. They thought they knew what the answers were. And really, they knew none of that. But the beautiful part was when they would just sit with him in his pain and when you're depressed you need people to walk in that and just be willing to be uncomfortable in your discomfort we've talked about that with respect to grief we've mm -hmm. talked about that with respect to abuse we've talked about that on that program with respect to cancer i think that's so important for us to remember we just need to be willing to be present. Mm -hmm. In spite of the discomfort and be willing to take that step into discomfort and into something that you're not in control of just to be present. It's not hard to be there, but it's hard to take the step into that. And I think what's so uncomfortable for people is silence. You know, we're yeah. always wanting to fill the silence with something. And that's when we get into trouble because we fill the silence and frequently we fill it by saying something that's inappropriate. And we're going to get into that after a commercial break. But I, we've been talking about some weighty matters. So let's take a minute okay. and take a commercial break. But stick with us. We'll be right back. and. 
after the break, we're going to talk about some of the things not to say to Mm -hmm. a depressed loved one, as well as some of the things that are beneficial to say. So listeners, stick with us. We'll be back in one minute with your hope-filled perspective. Welcome back to your hope-filled perspective with Dr. Michelle Benson. Today, we are talking about how to support a depressed loved one. And with me today is my husband, Scott Benson. I'm glad you're with us. Thank you. I really appreciate the invitation to be here. Now, as we were talking, there were a couple of things that came to my mind regarding my experience of supporting you through depression. We've talked about some of the specific things that you can do uh, as a caregiver or a, a someone who can come alongside the other person who's depressed. But in general, there were two things that came to my mind that I wanted to put out there. Uh, first, of, uh, first of these is that it's, it's not about you. Mm-hmm. This kind of goes in two mm-hmm. different ways. You're not there for the personal strokes of, of for the affirmation of being a good person to come alongside. You have to realize that you're going to put more energy into the other person than they're going to put into you. So this is the time in life where the scales are going to be tipped and you are, you are going to be the caregiver. So be willing to do that. But then the second way to understand this is to understand that whatever the other person's going through and however they reflect it to you, be it through anger or uh, denial of invitations or negativity, it's not your fault. It's not something that you point. have done. Right. And I stumbled on this as you were going through some of this. And I had to step back and I kind of felt like, well, what have I done? Why, why, you know, why am I getting this kind of response? And it took me a while to realize that it wasn't anything that I had done. It was the depression speaking. Right. It, that is such a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. It is not anyone else's fault. But you can come alongside and help. Yes. and be a support and in any relationship but in particular in marriage if you want a good relationship a way to have a good relationship is to put that other person first mm-hmm. and if you will do that you will reap the rewards and it's hard to do that especially when you're not getting the strokes. Yes, yeah, yes. And you're not going to when the other person is depressed. Yes. Because they're not able to look outside of themselves. I can tell you that when they're depressed, it's hard for them to see anything outside of themselves. But if you will love them through it, if you will support them through it, if you will try to walk with them and get them the appropriate help, they can get through it and they will remember that you were supportive. Mm -hmm. But if you look at them as if that's their problem and don't support them through it, they will also remember that. Sure they will, yes. The second thing that came to mind was the thought that that as as humans we're limited. You know, when you're the caregiver to someone who's depressed, it's not your depression. You can't go in as I frequently have habitually done as an engineer and say, well, I'm just going to fix this thing because I can fix anything. I'm going to get a little mental health screwdriver here and tweak, 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 and you'll be good as new, right? No, no. You're there to I wish that it worked. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> but you're, you're there supporting the person who has depression. You're providing those things that will uh, assist the person in dealing with this. Uh, diagnosis that they happen to be walking through at the mm-hmm. time you're not fixing them right you can't fix them only god only god can do yes. that yes right. yes so as limited creature we have to realize that we are limited creatures and we, we, we can't just change the whole the whole discussion and make that thing go away mm-hmm. that goes back to your point of being willing to step into the discomfort and walk through it with mm-hmm. them Yes. No magic wands to wave to make the discomfort or the condition go away. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good points. Good points. Okay. Well, in that uh, context, are there things that we shouldn't say to someone who is depressed? 
Oh, there's several things that we shouldn't say. You know, I, I hear these things frequently in working with patients. Please don't say things like it's all in your head or snap out of it or just pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Other things that you don't want to say is this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. Yes, it will pass. But when you're feeling depressed and you don't know when it will pass, that's not helpful. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same as when someone is going through cancer and they might be going through chemotherapy. The doctor still can't say if or when the cancer will go away. Mm -hmm. Please don't also say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> when you're depressed, you don't care about being stronger. Yeah. Okay. And you fear that it will kill you. Mm -hmm. And that is always in the back of your mind. Another thing that I hear people say all the time, and it's very demeaning and it just makes someone who's depressed feel worse is others are worse off than you. Well, that's true, but we can all think of others who are worse off than us. Right. But what that does is it demeans the person's experience. Mm -hmm. And there is value in acknowledging that what they are going through is difficult. It mm -hmm. is painful. And I guarantee that if you have not gone through depression, you don't want to go through depression. Another thing that I hear people say all the time, and I would encourage you not to say is, I know how you feel. Even if you've gone through depression, your experience with it will not be identical to someone else's experience. Your symptoms will often be different and the precipitating factors will be different. You can identify with some of the signs and symptoms. But I would avoid saying, I know just how you feel, mm -hmm. because chances are you don't. All of those things that we've just talked about really just serve to demean and discourage and really tell that person that you don't care. And really, those are the last things that you want to communicate to someone who's depressed. So on the other side, what are some things that, that, that are encouraging and truly helpful that you can communicate to the other person? Well, one of the best things that you can say is, I love you. I love you despite the depression.